was, uh, came up in uh, Paradise Valley. Uh, I came to Detroit from Alabama in the uh, late 50s. And uh, I met Eddie Jackson, he lived around the corner. Uh, my sister used to rent from uh, his father. And uh, I met him that way. Uh, the neighborhood was a very close neighborhood. Uh, normally you had to be uh, on your block when the street lights come on when you're a certain age. Uh, I could be out a little later because I was a uh, paper boy. That's how I got uh, to know and observe certain things about the streets because I didn't have to be in until uh, maybe 11, 12, sometimes one or two on the weekends. It was relatively safe. During this time, you could leave your doors open. Uh, they didn't have neighborhood watch. It wasn't incorporated then, but uh, uh, people would look out for you. People sell you somewhere else, and they say, ain't you so-and-so and so, or are you not supposed to be over here? You would instantly leave. You know? It was very close-knit. Uh, you had almost a store on every corner, be it a candy store or a grocery store. Uh, it, it, was, it was just a nice time. Even though uh, we was poor and it was hard times, I always think pleasantly. You know, back from that time. Uh, my sister used to rent from him. She stayed around the corner. Eddie's father, right? Uh, Eddie stayed on the corner of uh, Bovian and Vernon. His father owned a half a block terrace there. I lived on uh, Mount Carmel Street between Bovian and Saint Atwine, and uh, that's how I met it. Eddie's father was a, a pretty good businessman. He had a pool room there on the corner, and to my knowledge, he owned uh, 18 different rental properties. He had came to Detroit from uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, he was a different guy down there, but he changed his name. He had killed someone. And uh, I think he made his fortune, or the beginning of his fortune, uh, selling uh, homemade liquor. Uh, you know, and he put that into real estate. And uh, to my knowledge, he owned 18 different properties. This came from uh, Eddie and his brother himself. What was the, there was a lot of underground economy going on, Ken. Right, but uh, kids was kept from uh, stuff being. Uh, prostitution was at a, like a certain area, normally around the Verna and the Columbia Bar. Uh, and uh, you had drinking, uh, uh, moonshine was uh, a hustle that the people brought up from the south. Uh, and, and the people that don't know what moonshine is, you can be drinking uh, moonshine that's 150, 200 proof. It's just like drinking uh, slightly sugared water. And uh, you know, it's very smooth, smoother than perhaps champagne or even uh, the Cordon Bleu that costs so much money. Right, but it will get you drunk. Okay, so let's say what you do is you're starting to get to be whatever age you're and what was your first experience with the activities? What happened? I went to the military. Uh, straight out of high school, uh, I joined the Army. And uh, when I came home, one of the people, I told it to different people because when you first go away uh, and come home, I told Eddie that it's a world out there, uh, how women was in different cultures and different countries. And Eddie was very interested in that. He listened to that a lot. You know, hey, tell me about this here. Tell me this about uh, the Orientals when you was in Japan. Tell me this when you was this here, this place. And he was highly interested in that. But I didn't know that later uh, he would make some money and travel himself and go around around the world, literally. Well, what about, like, did, were you ever involved in the stuff? Well, me per se, uh, I, I don't gamble per se, you know. So you, you got pretty, pretty much straight-laced to some degree. We was, uh, we was straight-laced. We was, uh, more or less, uh, you, you might say, monkey hustle stuff. We used to, uh, when we first was traveling, 
used to travel to Kentucky uh, and buy pistols, come back and sell them, two, three, or four. And uh, uh, after I got out of service, because uh, it just, in 1965, I was in service from 1962 to 1965. Oh, I was in Vietnam uh, through the Tet Offensive. It, it was, they, it ended in 67 with the Tet Offensive. So I, it was just de-escalating when I was coming home. Detroit had, had really started changing when I come home. One of the main things I noticed at first, uh, uh, some of the guys wanted to stay out in Oakland, California for a while. And I wanted to rush home to Detroit and you know get back home. One of the first things I missed was the Gotham Hotel. This was a large black hotel that was uh, uh, very famous with black people. Uh, and it no longer existed. Uh, certain things had, uh, had changed. Uh, the, the city had started to slide, but you couldn't see it yet. It was just barely beginning, you know, to go down. So, how, when did you start, when did the era of thing? Um, the soldiers uh, in the army, uh, the, the heroin is so strong over in uh, the Orient that uh, you can't snort it, you can't shoot. They would smoke it, put it in a uh, in a cigarette with tobacco and smoke it. But uh, it, it's so strong otherwise, you know. And uh, guys came back with a habit that uh, the, the local drug couldn't support it because uh, the, the habit was so uh, bad. Matter of fact, I remember reading in the paper of a Medal of Honor winner uh, got killed by the liquor store. Uh, or probably to, uh, you know, get money for his drug habit because in Michigan, because you, Detroit, because you had to use more uh, by the drug being so powerful in Southeast Asia. You know? No, no, I was always, uh, ironically, I was always scared of drugs and in the same, never. I used to drink, but uh, never no drugs. He was coming back with the bag a little bit too quick and the bag was too good. I was like, you connected, boy. I know this. People who ain't connected can't do it like you. You like me. You'd be like, just wait one minute. Stay ready. No, no, don't go nowhere. No, no, you ain't got to go nowhere. Just <laughs> one minute. And when he said one minute, he meant one minute. Next thing, you will come back with that fish scale. I was like, this is Poppy. Yeah, I told you. I know big fella. He did, that was their phrase. I know big fella. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, game recognized game. Yeah, you do know, you do know a big fella. Says you ain't supposed to. If you can get it this good, this good, quick, you know a big fella.
economically and how do you get mixed up with hey let's start something here well um we was always friends growing up together and we was uh we was close and uh i got back and uh got a job uh at chrysler corporation and uh a lot of the the guys uh I used to take the written test for them for the uh, auto factory. Uh, it was about a 15 minute test. And uh, Eddie didn't go to school uh, uh, much. Matter of fact, he used to skip school a lot. And uh, I used to take tests for them at Chrysler. Anyway, I got a job at Chrysler. And uh, I remember going by Eddie's home and telling him that I had uh, 27 pairs of slacks, uh, this and that. And he might not even been working at the time. You know, him and his brother. They was more or less. Uh, this was before the nerve hustling. Right. Uh, gambling on the street, uh, running street cap crap game. He and his brother used to do that. And uh, later, I think uh, Eddie did work briefly in a plant because I remember he got his finger cut off. It was either at Ford's or I'm not sure which plant. Uh, and uh, later, he was driving a cab. You know. So you get a call. Tell us how, you know, the conversation of, hey, I got this going on and I want you to come in. Well, what happened, uh, I was visiting Eddie once and he had a guy over his house um, that uh, was a heroin dealer. He had a, a elder rider, a guy named Youngblood, uh, parked in front of his house. This was in what year, brother? Uh, in the 60s, around maybe 68 or 69. So. Right, right. Um, and uh, I watched this guy, uh, and he was uh, he, sn he was snorting some heroin, and I was looking at him hard. And Eddie hunched me and said, "Don't look at the man like you crazy." And uh, but that was the first that I saw. This guy had a, a grocery store, drove an Eldorado, was real sharp. He was he was dealing drugs. And shortly after that, uh, Eddie and his brother, because I was over there helping them cap up uh, dollar caps. They used to call them penny caps. So you could uh, actually buy one dollar worth of heroin. Right, in uh, gelatin caps. Uh, you buy the caps out the store empty. The, the caps were something like for either insulin or certain kind of medication that you take yourself. And uh, you, you buy them and you cap up the heroin. And it was called penny caps. They sold for a dollar, you know. Wow. So how did, um, hold on. Okay, uh, for me, uh, uh, capping up when Eddie and his brother had got into business with these uh, dollar caps, uh, they was getting a little bigger. They opened a place on uh, Hancock Street. And uh, by me working, having a job, I used to uh, go by, spend an hour or so there before I went to work. And in order to buy record albums, little deals that come through there, small TVs, electronic items. And uh, I happened to be there once. Uh, I so think. You were doing a hustle initially, just your buddies had a big spot, so you said, I'm going to go over there. Yeah, I used to go by, spend an hour before I go to work. Uh, buying electronics, right? Stealing out stores, bringing albums, record albums, uh, small TV stuff like that. I no, I buy it and keep it. I only buy stuff that I I wanted to keep, and I'd go by there before I go to work. So at this time, I think uh, Courtney was working with them, and uh, we knew everyone. I come by there, stay an hour, and then go on to work. Now uh, one time, a guy had pawned a pistol and uh, he uh, said he'd come to get it out. And by me being trusted, I knew where the pistol was kept in the other room. Uh, and the guy kept getting his gun and uh, ejecting the bullets out, but he would leave one bullet in the chamber. And I'm steady seeing this. He'd do this two or three times. So I ease in the other room and get the pistol, and uh, I said, you said you come to get your gun, where's the money? Get up against the wall. And 
The guy pulled out a bill with a man riding a horse, a $10,000 bill. Just at that time, uh, Eddie and his brother was coming and, uh, you know, they bought the gun from the guy. That's what gave me entree into the organization since I lived a block down the street. They wanted somebody that could come and pick up the money. And uh, Courtney was already working with them. And uh, this was uh, somewhere 68, 69. Yeah. They had, uh, had, 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 the business had built a little bit since then because they were selling uh, uh, penny caps, which is dollar caps, out the back door. And they were selling half quarters and eighths out the front. And an operation that size needs different people. One, you can't, one person can't estimate, uh, well, uh, it's only been an hour, uh, they haven't sold that much, or they might have could have sold a lot in an hour. So you needed two, three, four, five people to be going through at different times picking up the money. And that's how it, it started building uh, with the front five. Which so you're going and picking up, you're basically, all you got to do is at a certain time every day. Yeah, pick up uh, money, go through, and do that. Just then, describe the, the, so you got this apartment building, and it's dope getting sold out the back, it's people going upstairs to get weight. I mean, like, how, did, how crazy, like, what was the scene like? Uh, the, the buildings was kind of close together, and the building Eddie bought was near a college fraternity. It was on one side was a college fraternity. So uh, it, it, people wasn't running like a line or something like that. Uh, in the back you had gangways on each side and, uh, and plus people did more walking then. You know, if it wasn't a, a large crowd, it didn't look any way out of the way unusual. So you had people that go to the back. This was a shooting gallery where people uh, in, inject drugs into them. All right, in the front, we developed a system where uh, on my shift, I would open the door, customer, let the customer in, customer would give me the money. I would go up the steps, put the money through a chute in the door. They had made a pipe in the ceiling that uh, they would drop the dope down right in front of the door customer would pick it up. I took their money, but I never hand them any product. Then I would open the door and let them out. And uh, that's the way the operation worked. Did you, were you ever in there when there were police problems or police being paid off? Or? Uh, later, after the business really got big, uh, yeah, police uh, used to come once a month to get paid. Uh, How much were you guys making a day out? That place, uh, a uh, hundred thousand a day or more because uh, a lot of people don't realize the drug business fluctuates at certain times uh, you, you know I can't say exactly how much it made every single day at some time it made more than others but when you're selling uh, penny caps which is dollar caps quarters halves and eighths and plus Eddie sold weight too you know different parts of the city you know would meet somebody selling oh, them Oh, way more than that. It, 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 that might have sold uh, $100,000 worth a day or $50,000 worth a day, you know. It, it fluctuates, but uh, it was always up in the money. It was a lot more than $10,000, dollars or $30,000. What about, um, what about uh, buying a sphere of robbery? Like, what was the security precautions, or was it not really? At that point in Detroit, was it? We didn't have security problems at the joint because only one person, you couldn't come in three people and only one person buying. And as I said, the customer gave me the money. I took it upstairs, put the money in a hole in the door. The, the amount that they bought, they dropped and I let them out. That doesn't leave room for a robbery on that part. Uh, at the back in the shooting gallery where it was, uh, uh, you had people in there 
injecting heroin themselves, it might have been a chance for a robbery there. But to my knowledge, I don't think we had any robberies there. Not that I remember. What, um, if any, what were your feelings? I mean, did you ever have remorse or feel bad? Like, you know, your wife, in that time, a lot of people getting addicted to heroin and all that, or you just felt like that's their choice? Well, uh, people have always gotten high, whether people drank, uh, and uh, alcoholism or drinking was something that I saw. It, to me, it was just a new form of getting high. Uh, and, and the stress when I was in service of, of people getting high, I didn't look at it that unusual. It was only later that you see people uh, uh, with the swollen arms and swollen legs where you could see it was a health issue also. Uh, that made me had some thought. But uh, at the time, I, I didn't think anything of it because people have always drank, uh, you know, uh, people smoke uh, marijuana and so forth. And uh, I didn't think it was that bigger thing, you know. At some point, um, when Eddie decided, when you had the big plug, I, I don't want to run that building, I'm sure it would be something weight. Didn't you kind of get a chance to have your own Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, tell, tell us about that. that was a time that uh, Eddie figured he had went as far as he could uh, in the business that way. And uh, he said he was going to sell weight, uh, you know, sell people uh, kilos, ounces, and you know, different weights of drugs. And uh, we all, the people knew us as working there. And uh, uh, myself, 5 and all, we uh, set up our own, uh, Ronald Gary, we set our own operation up. And uh, now, 5 had his little crew. He had his, 5 had his crew, and I had my crew. Uh, we set up our own operation. What was your operation? Uh, I set up a block from Hancock on Forest. And uh, uh, forest between uh, John I and uh, the next street, uh, Brush, John I and Brush. And uh, I don't remember if I, but it's kind of vague and ambiguous. I don't remember who I saw. I did go up uh, to. I, I took $50,000 up. I'm, uh, I don't even remember who I gave it to. I swear I don't. So, uh, well, how did you bring it back? Uh, I know I went to uh, Cromfield or Layton. It was a known clothing store. Uh, you buy some clothes. They got these boxes. They put it in. And uh, evidently, back at the hotel room, I put the heroin in the clothes. And uh, when I get on the plane, I put it in the overhead compartment. This, is before this was sure. before the hijack profile. The hijack profile didn't start until 1972 that uh, some black people in Detroit hijacked a plane, a group of them, and got away with a million dollars and the plane to Algeria. That started the uh, hijack profile where uh, if you just find one way with cash or whatever, and uh, after that, it changed things. You, you gotta use ground transportation or whatever. You gotta, before that, you go to New York, buy some dope, get on the plane. Buy some dope, put it on your person, or put it in the clothes packages, and get on the plane. And, and it was just that easy. So you know. really no, not then. Uh, 
at, at some point in time, Eddie said that uh, he was getting out of the business. Uh, the way I remember it, uh, Courtney stayed with him. Uh, Russell Clayton retired. Uh, uh, Five O and myself took different. Uh, I had my own operation. Five O had his, and uh, I had mine a block away from the old spot on the next street. And uh, instantly, my business took off. Uh, Five O's took off. I think he was downtown further, uh, maybe seven, uh, anywhere from forty to fifty thousand dollars a day. Yeah, and instantly it took off. I had to have shifts. I had shifts in the uh, uh, place, either two or three shifts, uh, at least two. It could have been three, because uh, nobody can stay up twenty-four hours a day with no uh, sleep. So uh, I know I had two shifts, and I could have had three, perhaps, you know. And uh, business instantly uh, was a success. I know I was making anywhere from thirty to forty to fifty thousand dollars a day. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, socially we would. Uh, A lot of money. Of course, I don't know this because we're not connected. When you, when everybody get their own, you know, they count up. Is is their money? And uh, you know, uh, I know he was a great success, but I thought he was perhaps making about the same as I was making. But uh, he he was making a hundred times more. You know. Uh. We just live the life of a sportsman, uh, you know, in the day, hang out. You might know, go through the pool room, uh, eat out in the restaurant, uh, you know, do some traveling, just uh, hanging out, doing whatever you want to do. You know. What about where you guys interacted with Motown people and going out of town? I had went to parties. Uh, 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 when you pay in your own way, and ain't asking for nothing. I had uh, some parties that uh, Motortown people gave. It, it was a, a guy, one of uh, Ronald Garrett's brother. He knew a lot of the entertainments, a guy by the name of Zach Garrett. Uh, he, he knew Ouija of the Dramatics, Eddie Kendricks, and so forth. But I went to some parties uh, that uh, Motortown people gave, you know. Well, I was just a, 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 a guy. And when you are selling narcotics, you really don't want to be known and want your name to be known. So, uh, well, you know, I was just a guy. Smart, All right, some people do want their name known, but I never wanted my name well, known. Let, let me say right into that. So at that, I mean, at that time, early 70s, that's when Detroit's murder rate started going up, things started getting wild in the streets. How did, well, basically, we uh, associated with each other since we knew each other coming up. Uh, we didn't go to a lot of the, the, about the only spot we went to where other people might go deal is maybe the 20 grand or something. Uh, we didn't like the, uh, the, the name dropping of, because uh, uh, you had notorious deal. It was coming up in the paper then. People was getting crossed out their life, uh, you know, and large sums of money missing. And, uh, you know, we kind of associated together, because I remember when we bought motorcycles, uh, we only rode with each other, you know, uh, the motorcycles. And, uh, you know, you kind of uh, stay to those you've known a long time and so forth. You know, new people is where you run into problems. People you just met are people that you don't know very well. So you guys never really had any problems? Not really. I remember one time downtown, uh, someone was talking about sticking up the Jackson brothers and uh, Eddie and his brother was shooting at somebody down the alley. Uh, it was in the bar, and uh, 
somebody had mentioned to somebody else that they was going to rob it because he used to wear diamonds and stuff. And uh, I remember they were shooting at the people down the alley. Nobody got hit and uh, so forth. But uh, oh, Eddie was an outdoor the person. Their father used to take them hunting. And uh, we went to the gun range several times uh, in uh, Mount Clemens, Michigan. Matter of fact, we got arrested for that once. Coming back, I neglected to put a German Luger in the trunk of the car and put it in the glove compartment because I was riding along and got stopped by the police and uh, was held in jail to Eddie and bond me out. We was teens. Uh, No, I, I don't remember any any opulence. They they father uh, kind of protected them. Uh, I think her mother died when he was young, but I don't remember any uh, opulence. Or, or, or it's one thing I do remember that uh, we used to go south uh, vacation in the summer, and uh, at a certain time, Eddie and his father and his brother used to go to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Except they had a car and, and my family didn't, you know. They had a Ford and uh, for whatever reason, uh, if their car would be new but with no radio in it. It was a blank plate. And Eddie's father said uh, a, a radio was excess use on the battery, you know. Well, Eddie was, uh, from what I gathered from him coming up, was a bad little boy anyway. He would, uh, he, was, he was known for theft, stealing. Uh, and uh, their father used to didn't let him go anywhere unless Courtney took him. And when you're coming up, some people uh, show adults that they're responsible, can be trusted. And, uh, you know, he used to, let Courtney take him different places, you know. So he looked up to Courtney because of that. Well, I mean, but Jim, all this stuff was going on. I mean, Eddie had a big... Well, Eddie, uh, uh, people see Eddie as a great businessman, which he was, and uh, he got this from his father. But I've always said uh, myself that uh, Eddie was an expert on understanding human nature. Uh, and a lot of people might not remember well enough to give him credit for that. Uh, this is another reason probably that uh, kept a lot of things from happening to him, is how he didn't get played out of his life, uh, because a lot of drug dealers did, through uh, uh, slick women and so forth. But, but Eddie was very good on human nature, you know, understanding human nature. Well, yeah, he was real charismatic, uh, you know, wore diamonds, flashy stuff, uh, wear his hair in this super fly hairstyle and so forth. Uh, but, but again, I say he was, I, I can't uh, uh, impress that enough that he had a, well, Courtney was uh, laid back too. He had a lot of wisdom. Uh, out of all the people, uh, we all worked together when we had shifts uh, operating the joint, you know, interrelating with each other. But uh, Courtney was kind of laid back like myself. Me and him used to do a lot of reading and uh, discuss things from books where Eddie and 5 they wasn't readers. You know, they was more or less uh, hands-on mother wits people where, uh, you know, Courtney and I, you know, we would discuss something either we read or whatever, and uh, so forth. You know. Well, they operated, they was, like Eddie was flamboyant when he was out in uh, public, uh, uh, going out, uh, I guess this was to impress women or so forth. But uh, as far as his private life and how he was, he wanted to be kind of low key or whatever. He might have wanted to flashy cars, have diamonds and flashy clothes, but, uh, in his private life, he was more or less uh, kind of low key. Oh yeah, the fam uh, I was at, when Eddie moved to Southfield, he said, I want these people to know I got some help and uh, I want y'all to come out here every day. So when they was working on the house, uh, 
you come out there and, uh, you know, look, met the real estate people. Uh, matter of fact, I was thinking of getting a house out there. I changed my mind on it, but uh, was thinking about that. So I used to go out there very regular. Uh, I was living on Prairie uh, between Joy Road and Chicago. Uh, it was nice. wasn't as opulent as the Westland Garden area inside. Uh, buying stuff. I, I, I didn't marry. I'd have never married. I didn't have children, and uh, I used to think of businesses, but uh, I never, with me operating alone. Uh, I never uh, uh, started a business, so uh, I just saved it. And uh, right, plus I bought whatever I wanted. Buy a car, order the next one the next six months, you know, without even knowing what it looked like. Well, what I found out, uh, the neighborhood that Eddie and Courtney lived in, and we was out there every day, we met the people who they bought the home from, and uh, so forth. So, and I discovered uh, the whims that rich people had. I think the people Eddie bought his home from named Soberman. Uh, her husband had a paint factory, and uh, to tell you the truth, I didn't know even people lived this. I know people had opulent wealth and so forth. But this lady, that uh, said she was going to be home alone while her husband traveled, and she didn't want her home to have a basement. It had a crawl space. And all this kind of stuff was eye-opening to me that uh, people, you know, I know people had fabulous homes, they looked nice, had beautiful gardens and everything. But just the idea of someone said they would be home alone and didn't want their home to have a basement and had it built with a crawl space, uh, you know, it was like amazing to me. You know, just amazing, you know. But that was the area they lived in. You had uh, the Motor Town Axe out there, Smokey Robinson down the street, Pete Moore, Dot Netta, one of the Holland Dozers in Holland. Uh, and uh, you had that kind of lip. So from that, uh, you learn, uh, you know, how the wealthy really live. You know? And uh, it's it just amazing to me that someone would have a home built and with a crawl space, no basement. Well, normal people, uh, a, a lot of people that forgot, Eddie uh, looked out for a lot of people. Uh, at the time, you used to see people walking in, uh, hey, here's so-and-so, I haven't saw you in a long time. So a guy might say, guy might be on hard times. I'm uh, uh, worried about my rent or something bad didn't happen this way. I remember Eddie giving a lot of people money and say, uh, oh, we need you, uh, you know, and uh, turn them on to the business. And uh, that's, that's how they would get involved. Oh, uh, he did that. Uh, uh, I don't know if he did it in the cycle of the welfare checks, but uh, he did that a lot of times. Uh, throwing money out of the car, uh, down in the Brewster Projects. Uh, oh, they just go crazy, grabbing the money and so forth. But see, you've always had poor people. Back up, uh, you had uh, bums, junk men, uh, stuff like that. And people who use heroin is subject to be uh, broke, especially if you used it a long time. And uh, as I said earlier about Eddie's uh, understanding of human nature, Eddie understood all that stuff uh, uh, about people. And this is another reason I believe that he threw the money out of the car and so forth uh, in cycles or whatever. And uh, be because he appreciated his customers. He also knew uh, without his customers, even though they was using heroin, it would be no him. Well, I wasn't, I had been over there because I didn't, uh, we still, cop drugs from Eddie, but it had their own operation. And uh, I had been over there, but I wasn't part of the raid and the bust on Hubble. Did you get indicted in the big indictment? Yeah, I got indicted in the big indictment. Oh, okay. uh, uh, 
I remember I was at home, I got a call one morning. It was a lady's voice. And uh, they was just really calling to see was I there. And I answered the phone and then they hung up. And I'm sitting on the side of the bed trying to figure out, uh, you know, what did this call mean? You know, someone call and then hang up. And the next thing, the door went crashing in and uh, they arrest me. Uh, this was in 72, I believe it was. And uh, that was it. Uh, you know, when you get arrested down at the federal building, you see different ones. Uh, uh, a, it was a 16 count indictment on manufacturing and distribution of heroin and cocaine. A 16 count indictment on manufacturing and distribution of heroin and cocaine. No, uh, once you got a case, we, we had like a meeting on it. And uh, if you go to prison, you still have to have some money. You still have to have some money to fight a case. True, Eddie did uh, bond us out. Uh, the lawyer, it, had, it was your responsibility to pay the lawyer. But uh, I remember this uh, like it was yesterday. Some people didn't pay the lawyer. They expected Eddie to pay the lawyer. Of course, I paid my legal bill. But some people, for whatever reason, expected Eddie to pay. Um, well, After we got arrested, we kept going. Uh, it, it was one tactical mistake made on the case. We had a meeting on it, and uh, Eddie said himself, uh, we're gonna have one trial with all 32 defendants tried at one time. And uh, not knowing nothing about the law, I hadn't read a, one law book, even though I was a good reader, uh, that was a tactical error. The best defense would have been to be tried individually, you know, and, and you might have a track record of 100%. But if you uh, are two, one jury looking at a dual bench bank trial, and someone told me that after I had got to prison, said I got a 10 year sentence, and told me, say, uh, that's the biggest sellout in the world, that we should not have took a dual bench trial with 32 defendants. And later, reading law books, my knowledge of the law, uh, that's very true. We should have took, the one person I think that uh, wasn't tried with us, I don't know, was it Carol Woods, a uh, guy we used to call Inkster Jones? Uh, I think he did take uh, individual trial. But he was all, uh, because we all hustled together and made money together, uh, went for the dual bench trial, 32 defendants, uh, you know, they hear in the testimony simultaneously. And that was very bad, very bad. What uh, I went in, uh, I can't remember if it was 74 or 77, because I got a revoked bail from continuing on. Uh, oh, so you I, didn't right, because I got a revoked bail. Me and Eddie wound up at the same prison and we both got a revoked bail from continuing to, I think Eddie traveled to New York and they caught him at the airport or something. Yeah, and uh, I kept going on and, uh, right. And they came on me and I got a revoked bail. So me and Eddie wound up at the same federal prison, which was Leavenworth. Yeah, but the SEP 5-0 was at another, he was at Terre Haute. Yeah. 
uh, Leavenworth was, uh, I used to watch that on the Untouchables, uh, Walter Witchell narrating. I never thought I'd grow up to go someplace like that. 40 foot wall, uh, no fence, a wall. And people used to tell me it's thick enough to drive a car. And they put me in there and I, I said, my life is over. Cause you can't see out. You just can see up, see the sky. You got bars, it's a very big prison, the old way, inmates build it. And uh, made me think of the, uh, the gangsters, uh, St. Valentine's Day massacre or whatever. Cause uh, you know, Bugs Moran, they used to be talking about Leavenworth. And uh, you know, it's, it's a very stark looking joint, very stark. Well, if you kept to yourself for your own business, stay out of people's business, if you don't try to borrow money, use drugs or whatever, you won't have any problem. You know? Well, it was people from all over. Uh, from reading a book, uh, uh, Jack Johnson had served time there. Uh, I think, oh, when I was there, uh, it's hard for me to remember who, but it was people from all over the United States there. Uh, uh, oh, yes, other people from Detroit. J.C. Rex was there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when you're away from Detroit, uh, and especially you don't have any dirt on your name, as they say, uh, people are always uh, welcome when you was there. This is so and so. He was with Eddie, and I think I was there first. I got to revoke bail before Eddie, and then Eddie came, and uh, J.C. Rex uh, was there. He happened to be a customer that used to cop drugs from Eddie, and uh, you had others, uh, Goodbye George, George Murphy, uh, he was from Detroit. Um, Oh yeah, George Blair was there, another person from uh, our case. Oh yeah, George Blair had uh, met the agents out at the Ramada Inn uh, uh, to give information against us, uh, you know. Oh no, it, well it doesn't, as I said, Eddie had an a expert grasp on human nature. And it's already been done. You're already in a prison. So to, to kill somebody that sent you there just because they sent you to the same prison as them, it doesn't really make sense. It's almost as if uh, the way you move chess pieces to, uh, uh, you know, against one another, you know. I just once said, Eddie is... Uh, as I stated, I had been in the Army, and uh, Eddie used to go hunting with his father. And uh, we had uh, put a target up in the basement, drew some bullseye on it, uh, and was shoot. You know, he put it back with some hot water where it uh, uh, wouldn't hurt anything. And was shooting, uh, I think we had a, a 357 and a 9mm, just having some fun. and. Uh, a guy named George Blair that worked for, uh, came uh, to the door, rang the doorbell. I'm just a visitor at Eddie's house, and Eddie sent uh, Joe Weaver up. I thought Joe Weaver went up there. Joe Weaver was there, I believe. Yeah. But I, I keep thinking it's Joe Weaver. Uh, well, anyway, uh, he, he sent Charlie Moe up to the door, uh, and uh, he sent a message back down, say, uh, George want to see you. Eddie said, tell him uh, that by 10 minutes he would uh, meet him anywhere he wanted to or whatever. And he went back up to tell George Blair that. George Blair said, uh, tell him if he want me move, then send somebody to move me. So. Uh, uh, well, this was actually told on the second time, because when he told the individual to go tell George that, 
Eddie told me, he said, Rudolph, you know how to talk to people. He said, go up there and tell him I'll meet him anywhere, give me 10 or 20 minutes. And uh, I went to tell him that. And he said, I tell you what, since you're taking messages for Eddie, you tell Eddie if he want me moved to send somebody to remove me. So I went back and told Eddie what he had said. And Eddie, first he picked up uh, the nine millimeter or something. Then he picked up the 357. And he went up and uh, I was walking right up with him. It was still right by him. And, uh, he came out the door, and for whatever reason, George had got in the passenger side of a new Thunderbird. It was a lady under the wheel. You couldn't see her because she lived there. She was a short lady. The car had uh, the first year barber type seats come out where the car let back at an angle where you could sleep. And George had the seat somewhat reclined. And Eddie was walking toward the car, and before he got there, he just like explode. He, he, he uh, leveled the gun, and uh, the window shattered. He walked further. I'm right by. I walked right with him. He's in uh, another window shattered. So I think George is dead or whatever. He got up to the car. He said, uh, "If you come out here again, I'll put a hundred big ones on your head." and hit him upside the head with the pistol and the gun went into the floor. And George was telling the woman driving the car to uh, start the car, she couldn't function. She, she was just in shock. And uh, I'll say this for George, he got out of the car, walked around the car, and got in the car and drove out. The car looked at it, it had been in a wreck by all the windows where the bullet are. But that actually happened, and I was there. Uh, what role did you see in that? Well, uh, uh, I, I, you probably look around. Uh, one of the places I went, and, and I do remember this when I got out of that, I happened to be out in Southfield looking for a job. So and, I mean, you didn't get back involved in something, though? Well, no. Uh, and I remember going to Eddie's house and his, uh, son, they didn't open the door. And, uh, it, it, and they said, this is uh, Charles Rudolph. Uh, you know, I just wanted to see, because I used to go to the house so much. And they said, yeah, I know Rudolph, but I don't know you. They, you know, there's kids, and all them years, they didn't remember me, you know, uh, uh, whatever reason, you know, somebody standing at the door. You know, and, uh, you know, I just went on. I just merely stopped by there since I used to be out there every day and so forth, and I just stopped by there. 